Hare Krishna. So thank you for coming today morning. And we'll continue our discussion on are our mistakes part of Krishna's plan? Yesterday I talked about how there's a difference between a plan and a purpose. Krishna doesn't want us to commit mistakes, but if we do commit mistakes, he accommodates them within his overall plan. Just as a student failing in an exam is not a school's purpose, but the school has a plan for those students who fail also. Then we discuss what do mistakes mean? So sometimes if something is done with the wrong intention, sometimes the wrong action is done, and sometimes uh, an action turns out to have wrong consequence. Then we may say it's a mistake. And discussed about how with respect to consequence, uh, sometimes a small an action that does not even seem to be wrong initially turns out to be wrong, or a small mistake can have a big consequence. That's because past karma also plays a significant factor and then mistake also in one way more recently understood that uh, in bhakti for pleasing Krishna intent is what matters but for getting a result in this world content also matters and if if a devotee commits a mistake in terms of choosing a wrong course of action then at a material level the reaction will be there mm. at a spiritual level Krishna will not forget the service that has been done uh, so just like Bhishma, Krishna did not neglect his uh, service because he committed a mistake. But at the same time, he did not overlook his mistake just because he was a devotee. So uh, today I'll continue and discuss about how when we are practicing bhakti, at that time, what, or what do the, how do the results of mistakes play out and what can we do? to avoid those consequences. So for a devotee, we often say that Krishna is personally in charge. That there is a law of karma which acts for all living beings. But a devotee is not under the law of karma. The devotee is working, we could say, under the principles of love. So the example could be that if a person has done something wrong, then the police may punish the person or if a child has done something wrong a parent may punish the person at an external level the punishment appears to be the same mm. but the whole context is very different the context for a the context for a devotee is like a parent offering a punishment and the context for a devotee is context for a non-devotee is like the police offering a punishment so mistakes do have their results but the context is different for a devotee and because of the context being different the long-term consequence also is different if uh, if we consider say one a person does something wrong and then the other complicating factor is that somebody else suffers because of that so uh, a non-devotee does something wrong and a devotee suffers because of that or one devotee does something wrong in a non-devotional mood and another devotee suffers because of that so is such suffering ordained by Krishna now again there are two ways of understanding this at one level Krishna never wants anyone to suffer so Krishna wants the good for everyone. So uh, Sarva, when we say Krishna is the cause of all causes. Now there's a subtle difference. He's the cause of all causes, but that does not necessarily mean that he's the cause of all effects. What is the difference between the two? That means if any vegetation grows on the earth, the cause of that is the rains. If there were no rains, no vegetation would grow on the earth. So in that sense, the rain is the cause of all vegetation's growth on the earth. But at the same time, which specific vegetation grows where, that is not determined by the rains. That is determined by the soil over there, that is determined by the kind of seeds that are sown over there, that is determined by the overall climate over there. So the rain is not responsible if a thorny bush grows somewhere and the rain is, uh, rain cannot be blamed if cactuses grow somewhere. 
So the similarly, Krishna is the cause of all causes, but he is not necessarily responsible for the specific actions and the specific results that occur in the world. So that there is the uh, that is because souls have free will, and according to the free will, they may sometimes choose to misuse their free will. So. <coughs> It is that sometimes in a philosophy there is a question that if God is omnipotent, then how can we possibly have free will? If Krishna is the ultimate controller, then how, how can we have any control over anything? Yes, it is that Krishna is omnipotent, Krishna is supreme controller, but he has by his own plan chosen to give us free will. And that free will is something which every soul eternally has. Now, what changes as a result of our actions is the scope of our free will. So, for example, the king is the supreme authority in a kingdom. But the king also gives freedom to the citizens. And different citizens can move about and do different things in the kingdom. Now, if a citizen breaks the law, then the citizen is put in a jail. And in the jail, the citizen's freedom gets significantly curtailed. Still the, still, the citizen is also under the care of the king only. But the significance, but the freedom has become curtailed because of the past misdeed. So similarly, we are all always within the purview of Krishna's control. But the specific scope of freedom that we have varies. Yatha akash sthito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan tatha sarvani bhutani matsthani tyopadharaya. In the 9th chapter 6th verse, Krishna says, just as the, the wind is situated in the sky, similarly, all living beings are situated in me. Now, in the sky, the wind, if you envision the sky to be like an upside down bowl, then the wind doesn't, uh, wind is not absolutely controlled by the sky. The wind can move left, right, up, down. Uh, the wind, wind has this capacity to move. Its movement is not restricted. The scope of its movement is restricted. The scope of its movement is restricted by the sky. The movement itself is not restricted. Similarly for us, the scope of our movement is restricted by Krishna through the arrangement of past karma. So for example, an elephant has the power to bring down a big tree and, and may find it difficult even through push a blade of grass aside. So, uh, some human beings may have by their past karma, they may have the power and position to say detonate, send off a weapon which can destroy a whole country. Some people uh, may not have much power and they just basically struggle to etch out a living and they can't do much. So this prakriti refers to broad material nature. Kshetra refers to the subset within material nature over which a particular soul has control. So the soul is called Kshetragya. This is the third chapter of terminology. And the area over which the soul has control, that is the Kshetra. Say a particular person is elected as the president of a country. Then by that election, the kshetra increases substantially. Then in the next uh, election, that person loses and now becomes the opposition leader. Then also they have some kshetra. Their field of area control is there, but it's significantly limited as controlled as compared to earlier. Hmm. Then over a period of time, that same president may get a Parkinson's disease or something like that, uh, may get Alzheimer's and may forget also in the same lifetime that I was the president at one time. Then their, their kshetra, their area of influence has gone substantially down at that time. So now, while a particular person has Krishna's arrangement been given a large kshetra, now if that person decides to misuse their free will and act in a vicious way, then some people may be victimized by that. And when they are victimized, then it is not that Krishna wants that victimization. 
but krishna doesn't intrude on our free will and when somebody is given a big kshetra big area of influence that is because they have used their free will properly and done some good karma in the past so when draupadi was dishonored now krishna did not want the dishonoring of draupadi certainly not uh, krishna did not uh, but when dushasana duryodhana karana they all has that conspiracy now by their past karma they had certain power certain influence and they misused it so when hitler put the uh, jews in the uh, gas chambers and tortured them and kill them now it is not that god wanted that to happen but hitler had been given his free will and by his past karma he was meant to have some power and he would have become a powerful leader either way but he chose to become a powerful leader who brought about great destruction he if he had used his free will properly he could have become a powerful leader who could have done good also in fact when hanuman saw ravana for the first time in his court at that time the first thought that came in hanuman's mind was you know he's such a powerful person if he had been virtuous he would have been a great ally of the gods he would have spread dharma so far he would have done so much good to the world so he saw that this person has been given the kshetra if only this person had used the kshetra properly so when actions happen in this world when somebody say cheats us somebody hurts us so then there what is happening there are normally we think that is that is god's will and everything happens by god's will actually that is a the word will can have different connotations uh, more precise saying if you look at the bhagavad gita is everything happens by god's sanction it is not necessarily by god's will krishna says upadrashta anumanta ch krishna is not saying that everything happens because he wants it to happen it is he allows certain things to happen and the difference is that certain things are bad and at the super soul he will prompt from within the heart that don't do this but some people if they repeatedly choose to neglect what krishna is saying then krishna withdraws and then the voice of conscience starts getting muted if uh, first time say a person who has never killed an animal takes a knife to butcher an animal there's some twinge of conscience hey, you're killing an animal don't do this second time so there is a little twinge third time is lesser ten times on the line that person may be just chit chatting with others and like we cut sabji they may cut animals may cut a chicken or something like that they don't even realize because when we repeatedly act in a particular way then the super soul sees that and says okay you don't want guidance then i won't interfere so then when actions happen in this world there is there is god's will but god's will is not the determiner of specific things that specific people do there is god's will and there is free will there is by god's arrangement all of us have free will and then when a particular person acts in a particular way again and again and again then that becomes a steady behavioral pattern so basically when we see something is a habit or something is a steady behavioral pattern what does it mean that so usually there is a stimulus and there is a response say if somebody serves me some food i'll think should i eat this or not eat this so the food coming in front of me is a stimulus my choosing i'll eat this no i have eaten enough not uh, not this I'll, then the response is there when we say something has become a habit that means the distance between the stimulus and response has become very less as soon as the stimulus comes immediately the response will come if somebody is addicted say to alcohol then that means as soon as the desire for alcohol as soon as the desire for alcohol or the object or say a bottle of alcohol comes in front of them immediately they will act so this becomes a you could say solidified habit where over a period of time it may appear as if the person has no free will at all although they have always have free will but in that particular case because of the repeated action the impulse and the the stimulus and the response have become almost instinctively tied together so when this happens this accumulated anartha can be called as evil now there is no evil as a evil being like satan even maya is not evil maya is also krishna's energy 
Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the third chapter, the analysis that Krishna presents over there, a question may come up. Uh, based 3.36 to 43, he talks about karma, about lust, which refers not just sexual sexual desire, but any kind of self-defeating desire. So now, is lust or anger or greed, is it just a feeling we have or is it also an object within us? Krishna says that lust is situated in the senses, the mind and the intelligence. Indriyani mano buddhir asya dhishthanam uchyate. So is lust uh, uh, just a feeling or is it a thing? Actually it is both. It is lust can be a desire. I want to I want to do this. I want to do this. Greed can be a desire. I want to do this. But greed is also a imp- greed is I mean, greed we could say greed can be an intention and greed can also be an impression. An impression means it is stored within us. So simple example is say if somebody is surfing on the net and they repeatedly visit a particular site, say repeat Bollywood.com. They visit it again and again and again. And now they want to, now they have come to a spiritual program, they heard about the Bhagavad Gita, they want to Google Bhagavad Gita. So they type bhagavadgita.com, they want to type that. But as soon as they type B, <laughs> what will happen? <laughs> Bollywood.com. <laughs> so now Bollywood.com was an intention which they had early. But that intention became stored in their browser as a preference. And then it comes up automatically. So that was a, so that Bollywood.com was a choice, but that choice has also become a stored preference now. So similarly for us, when we choose a particular action again and again, it's a choice. So becoming lusty, becoming greedy, becoming angry is a choice. But when a choice is executed repeatedly, then that becomes stored as an impression within us. And that impression makes that choice in future not only much easier, but actually it becomes almost difficult to resist it. So it's initially the choice has to be intentional. Initially, I have to type Bollywood.com to go there. But either after some time, just type B and Bollywood.com comes automatically over there. So if a person has done the wrong choices repeatedly again and again, then the, the impressions related with those wrong choices get accumulated within them. And these people can act as evil people. As what? Evil, evil people. So basically when say bad people do bad things, then what happens? There is God's will, which, which God doesn't want us to do evil. But there is our free will also, each individual's free will. But if that free will has been used repeatedly again and again, then this third factor which pushes the free will to act in a particular way comes in, that is evil. So actions in this world are determined by all these three things, God's will, free will and evil. So sometimes some people, like say they are said to be psychopaths. A psychopaths means they have no conscience. They may kill, they may brutalize, and they don't feel any pang at consciousness, conscience at all. So what has happened? The evil has become so accumulated within them that their sense of right and wrong has completely been, num- been numbed and dumbed. So when a person is subjected, when if a person has a particular person by their karma has a particular kshetra, and if we happen to be in the kshetra of that person at that time and that person has evil impressions within them and then they attack us, they victimize us, they cheat us then this is by no means God's intention and when this happens at one level we have to see that this is uh, it is important that we uh, recognize that person's evil and take action against that. So for example, when uh, when say Sita is abducted, <coughs> now nobody in the Ramayana ever tells Sita that it was your own karma because of which you were abducted. Of course Sita is uh, the goddess of fortune and she is beyond karma. Now when the bad thing happens, the focus is primarily on what was, what was uh, Ramana's misdeed over there. So if somebody has done wrong and somebody is suffering because of that, then now we may just have been unfortunate or careless because of which so we could say Sita was a little careless that she just stepped out of the Lakshman Rekha even when she was told not to. So that was a small mistake on her part but because of that it was a grievous consequence. 
So similarly for us, if there is a small mistake because of which lack of judgment or lack of discretion by which we end up under the in the kshetra of somebody who is a who is an exploiter, who is an abuser, who is a victimizer, then at that time it is important that the, that the person who is who is who has done the misdeed that is the person considered responsible. There there is a phenomena called blaming the victim. Why did you do that? Now that is never seen in the Vedic culture at all. And the idea is that if somebody has done something, that person is held responsible. Now of course the person who came under the sphere of the influence of the victim, they also need to learn to be cautious. But at that time the important thing is to see what is the right course of action. So if, uh, uh, if somehow this happens, so somehow you know we just happen we get uh, we get cheated or betrayed by someone who does something wrong so at that time <clears throat> again this is this mistake is this this thing happening is not krishna's purpose but it is a part of krishna's plan it can be so now krishna's plan is something which can which we shouldn't think that it's like a fixed plan krishna's plan is dynamic when say some computer programmers write a program now if the program is rigid you know this happens this will happen this happens this will happen this happens this will happen it's a good program but if that program has self learning capacity you know okay if this happens you, know, you should learn to do this like this this happens you should learn to do like this so you know, that self learning capacity is considered to be a indication of a of a greater programmer of a better programmer so similarly you know, we when we work in material nature actually we all have we all have a particular body which is tends to function in a particular way so that is the habit but we all have the capacity to learn and learn doesn't just mean the soul has to learn the mind also learns that's why krishna says the mind can be the enemy and the mind can also be the friend so when somebody has done something wrong at that time the key thing is how we move forwards and krishna's plan which we say karmana daiva netrena which krishna's plan which works under the supervision of material nature that is we could say flexible so even if some mistake happens in somebody's life that doesn't mean that that mistake takes the person out of krishna's purview krishna's plan can accommodate by which that uh, that whatever happens thereafter can also be included in the scope of krishna's plan so in that sense even if we commit one mistake five mistakes 10 mistakes that doesn't mean that we are going to be rejected by krishna we are all no matter how many mistakes we have committed krishna is still there there in our hearts krishna is still guiding us so we do not have to ever become discouraged just because we have committed mistakes in the past or just because we have conditionings which push us to make wrong make mistakes or we are in conditions where bad things keep happening to us or where we are we are put in situations of distress say somebody is in a place where say like the middle east where one cannot practice bhakti publicly or in china where hinduism is also not considered a official religion at all so where devotees has to practice bhakti have to go through great risks now somebody sometimes we may in conversational sense use this word no oh, i am living in this god forsaken place but actually god has never forsaken any place <laughs> you know god is always there everywhere and his grace is also available everywhere but sometimes circumstantially we may be in a situation where certain practices may be more difficult but krishna is always there with us so as i said at a material level mistakes will have their consequences and those consequences may limit certain options at a material level say if i if i want to do if i want to give a class but say before the class i i eat very oily food or i eat a, several ice creams and my throat gets affected by that so i can't speak at that time so it is a mistake which i committed that mistake will have a consequence at the material level 
but that just because of that mistake that doesn't mean that i can i'm no longer connected with krishna rejected me a mistake at a material level will have a consequence at a material level and a consequence at a material level me will mean that a particular the particular services which require certain material activities may not be possible but the principle of connecting with krishna is always there okay i may not be able to speak i can hear i can do some other service so the material and the spiritual in that sense they are two parallel streams they are two parallel uh, uh, streams of reality and at a material level actions will have their material consequences even for devotees but if the devotee is devotionally inclined is devotionally uh, determined then even if something at a level turns out to be unfavorable krishna can bring good even out of the bad sometimes some devotees get some terrible diseases so some devotee gets cancer and sometimes we find that after they get cancer they become extremely serious about bhakti and then they become very serious and then they actually in very devotional consciousness they depart from the world so then we may say that okay that cancer was actually a good thing a cancer is not a good thing it is rather their response to the cancer that made it a good thing you know some devotees are, uh, they hear this prayer kunti maharani says that you know let calamities come in my life and that way uh, i'll remember you so now should we say that let calamities come in my life actually it is not that calamities are the producer of bhakti it is it is krishna says in the bhagavatam that bhakti is ahituki so the, the bhagavatam says bhagavatam is ahituki so now it is not that if somebody gets cancer everybody who gets cancer will become a devotee not like that so what it is is that it is our choices which will determine how we will grow in bhakti so so the important thing is that whatever be our past choices we try to make the right choice right now we try to make the best choice possible in the situation sometimes we may be in a situation that right choice may just not be possible say for example if i have a disease and the only medicine available for that is a medicine which has meat in it usually there are always vegetarian vegan alternatives but if it is not there then what do i do i may have to take that medicine you go so in rupa go swami says in the in one of his books that if a devotee has to take like even on fasting days we may take medicines medic taking medicine is not considered breaking a fast similarly in ayurveda there are also descriptions sometimes of non vegetarian medicines so somebody in a situation like that that's okay prabhupad told harikesh maharaj that you know he told that in the soviet block we don't get vegetarian food prabhupad said eat meat but preach the point is not eat meat the point is preach so the point is that sometimes the material level we may be put in a situation where certain choices may just not be possible but that doesn't mean even if a specific choice is not possible that doesn't mean um, our devotion is not possible if we equate devotion with certain external forms now only if i'm doing this i'm practicing bhakti only if i'm chanting hare krishna i'm practicing bhakti but tomorrow if somebody becomes dumb because of some disease then then does that mean that bhakti is no longer accessible to them no they can chant in the mind they can remember krishna in the mind they can hear they can hear about krishna they can in every situation krishna is accessible the specific form of access will vary from person to person from situation to situation so when certain forms become inaccessible for us because of the because of certain situations which we understand are reactions to our own past karma we focus not on oh why did i make this mistake if only i had not made this mistake this would not have happened okay what's happened has happened now how can i make the best choice how can i move forward right now and the mood of a devotee is that in every situation let me move towards krishna and if we even within devotion if we become attached to particular facility for practicing devotion then that may cause an interruption in our devotion now if i am in a particular uh, community where the mood i like the mood very much and then i get transferred i have to go to somewhere else and that in that community the mood is very different then what do i do and i have to find out some service which i can do over there and i have to continue my practice of bhakti yes it mean the same way i was practicing bhakti may not be possible but i have to keep practicing bhakti 
wherever i go so uh, the association of devotee sometimes we may have it sometimes we may not have it sometimes the association of a spiritual master we may have it we may not have it but we if we equate devotion with particular forms of service particular forms of expression then those forms may sometimes because of situations because of consequences of our past mistakes may become inaccessible but that does not mean krishna is rejecting us krishna is still there with us kunti maharani says that this is the ganga always flows towards the ocean let my consciousness flow towards you so now we could say the various services that we are doing the various forms of bhakti that we are practicing they are like different channels for our consciousness to flow towards krishna sometimes one channel may get blocked say i decide to be a preacher but somehow my throat gets spoiled then i uh, if my service is preaching throat getting spoiled is a serious problem it will interrupt my service and i should try my best to get my throat healed but if it can't be healed then let me try to see and do what other service i can do so we have to make sure that there is some channel by which our consciousness is moving towards krishna we want to be attached initially when we are attached to material things it is good to become attached to spiritual things it is become good to attach to say devotees it is become good to attach to a particular service but as we move forwards we need to become not so much attached to the service but to the object of the service so that okay even if i can't do this service then i can do some other service and move on towards krishna and this will also happen by the steady practice of bhakti that if i just keep practicing bhakti steadily then uh, the attachment to the ob- to the object of service will grow from attachment to the service so it's not that attachment to service is bad it is good if somebody loves book distribution that's very good but say if they become so old and the body becomes infirm that you can't do book distribution uh, then if they have been ser- doing book distribution regularly then that that will purify them that will increase the attachment to krishna and even when uh, one can't do book distribution one will have the uh, inner attraction to krishna so that one can just hear and be absorbed in krishna so i'll conclude about this mistakes point with one interesting scriptural narrative in the mahabharat before the kurukshetra war many great sages come and tell dhritarashtra stop your son from this disastrous course of action so vyasadeva comes uh in parshuram himself is there many sages come and the trash tries to feebly stop duryodhana and he tries to feebly argue against the sages also at different times so initially he tells with dura that actually you know if this war is dest- destined then what can i do what can i a tiny mortal uh, do to stop the will of almighty destiny so how does uh, vidura respond over there he says o king destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves destiny determines the consequences of our actions not our actions themselves if a student doesn't study for the exam and the mother says please study the student says whatever is my destiny i get that <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> that is not surrender to destiny that is simply irresponsibility so he says we have to do our part sometimes after doing our part also the result may not come then we can say destiny so destiny doesn't determine our actions we always have free will so um, now uh, uh, about 25 years ago when i started giving classes i was given some guideline by some senior devotee so he said last guideline was depend on krishna <laughs> but in bracket but only after you have prepared <laughs> <laughs> so if i don't prepare it, i say i'm depending on krishna that's a responsibility so anyway vidura is very strong at this point it is destiny that determines the consequences of actions only not the actions themselves Stry- stop your son and then when vyasadeva also comes here oh oh sage isn't everything determined by destiny isn't this world determined by destiny so vyasadev is silent for a long time and then vyasadev says o oh king what is the will of destiny is very difficult to determine what we should determine is our duty <coughs> think our duty think deeply what you should be doing and act wisely now after the war is over the trashtra is devastated all his 100 sons are dead and he is in so much remorse 
so much uh, self uh, self pity so much uh, agony at that time vyasdev comes to meet him and vyasdev tells him that o king do not lament this war was destined this war was destined and the the your sons were actually uh, they were sent they were representatives of the anavas who had come to this war and there was ordained a big fight between the devas and the anavas and they had to die so just put the past behind you and move forwards in your life now so now earlier it was told that this war is not destined and now it is being told the war is destined so what is going on over here so the important the point is that there is philosophy and there is the purpose of the philosophy so the philosophy is meant to help us r- rise in our consciousness we have in the 8th canto 7th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam <clears throat> ranyakashipu speaks the same philosophy as krishna is speaking in the bhagavad gita you are not the body you are the soul therefore do not lament for bodily death but his conclusion is because i am the soul i am eternal i will perform austerity lifetime after lifetime till i become strong enough to kill vishnu and revenge the death of hiranyaksha so the philosophy he knew it but the purpose of the philosophy was lost to him so maya mayaya apahrita gyana gyana is there but the purpose of the gyana is lost so similarly okay there is knowledge of destiny but there is purpose so initially for dhritarashtra his duty was to try to stop his son so the sages told him don't bring destiny into the picture right now you you focus on what is your duty but now what has happened is happened over now nothing can be done about it the mahabharat says that uh, that lamentation achieves nothing except to sap the energy of the lamenter okay why did this happen why did this happen why did this happen yesterday i talked about grieving you know grieving is an is a natural part of healing but if just one keeps living in the past again and again and again without moving forwards then that achieves nothing so now what is dhritarashtra's duty now try to live according to dharma now so the purpose now is after the event has happened how okay, can you see it as destiny don't blame yourself for the mistake now it's over and move forwards in your life so there is philosophy and there is the purpose of the philosophy so it is important for us to understand which aspect of philosophy is to be applied when and thereby we even if some mistake has happened from our past in a big bias because of us in the past and some terrible thing happened we can see that it is destiny and now let me move forward in my life that means when it is say it is destiny that means there was some higher plan going on and that higher plan can go on even now so if we see that the essence of krishna's plan or the ongoing progress of krishna's plan depends not so much on what has what is happening to us or even on how we have acted in the past it depends on how we are acting right now so if now we try to move towards krishna if we try to serve krishna then we are on the straightest the best path towards krishna so with this understanding a devotee can always be hopeful yes i may have made mistakes in the past in fact the whole shrimad bhagavatam we could say at one level is description of how people commit mistakes and how still they are redeemed the whole parikshit maharaj committed a mistake we have jad bharat committed a mistake we have ajamil committed a mistake chitraketu committed a mistake so many great people who commit some mistakes but through it all krishna brings out good not only good krishna brings them to the best now each of them the mistake that happened from them was different in different circumstances but still krishna brings good out of everything so if you understand this point and just focus on trying to serve krishna as well as we can in our situation then our mistakes even if they have happened they won't be thwarting krishna's plan they won't even be interrupting krishna's plan they may may, may cause the modification of krishna's plan but as long as we are trying to serve krishna the purpose of krishna is being fulfilled and we will be moving towards krishna 
That's why Srila Prabhupada said, if you want to pray to Krishna, the best prayer you can offer is, Oh Krishna, please give me the strength to serve you. Please give me the strength to serve you. If we have this, if we offer this prayer, then whatever situation comes in our life, if we are striving to serve Krishna, then we are growing spiritually and ultimately we will attain Krishna. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. Uh, are our mistakes a part of Krishna's plan? And that I talked about primarily how <coughs> our mistakes, uh, some, one, our mistake may be that we might just come under the influence of somebody who is brutal. And that will also have its consequences. So I talked about the concept of the, how the, everything is happening ultimately under Krishna's control. But Krishna is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. Just as which vegetation grows where is not determined by the rains. So now all, every soul has by Krishna been given a free will. And by their past karma, they have been given scope in which they can act on their free will. So that is their kshetra. And if we happen to be their scope, uh, scope that scope, then we may be affected by their actions. So if a person acts in a particular way again and again, that becomes a habit. Habit essentially means that the impulse and response become very closely tied to each other. And certain anarthas like last anger, greed, they are not just desires or intentions that we have, they are also impressions within us. Like I choose a particular website, but then also that becomes a preference which gets chosen by default. So some people who repeatedly act in wrong ways, they become evil in the sense that uh, the evil choices become, they just become conscienceless. And if somebody be, happens to be in their vicinity, then if they are victimized, that should not be considered their mistake or that should not be considered to God to be blamed. It's that, the, it's that person's terrible misuse of the free will. They will get the consequences for their actions. And at that time, so there is f our free will, there is divine will and there is evil. And all these three determine what happens over here. So if some mistakes do happen, Krishna's plan is inclusive and flexible enough that in spite of the mistakes, Krishna can keep helping us move towards him. So Krishna's, pur Krishna's purpose is that we make the right choice. And the right choice is always to try to come towards Krishna. At a, so the material and the spiritual can be two, seen as two parallel streams. At a spiritual level, Krishna is always available to us. But at a material level, certain actions may lead to certain reactions because of which certain forms of service may not be accessible to us. So we need to become attached not to a particular service but to the object of service. And we see all our services as channels by which our consciousness is moving towards Krishna. If one channel is blocked, then we find some other channel by which our consciousness can move towards Krishna. And if some mistake has happened, after it has happened, we can see it as destiny. Like Dhritarashtra was initially told, this war is not this time. You have to do your duty. But after the war is over, he was told, Vyasa, see it as destiny and move on with your life. So philosophy doesn't ex exist in isolation from its application. So we have The purpose of the philosophy is to help us move towards Krishna. And that's why we have to, uh, we have to see that we have free will, but there is also destiny. And which Focusing on which aspect will help us to make the right choice, that's the aspect that we focus on. If something is unchangeable, we accept it as destiny and move on. If something we can do to change it, we see it as our free will and focus on uh, using our free will properly in that situation. So ultimately, no matter what mistakes have been done in the past, no matter what difficulties we are in the present, if we strive to move towards Krishna, then we are not only within the purview of Krishna's plan, but we are also helping further Krishna's purpose and Krishna will ultimately bring good out even of the terrible things that may have happened in our lives. So whatever whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. No. <laughs> whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. The example of Dhritarashtra, which you were explaining, that he was being given knowledge by various sources that he could stop the war. And he argued that this is destiny. And Vidura said that your actions are not destined, but the results are destiny. 
what could have been the alternate path which he would have accepted and still the same things would have been resulted can you better explain that so that i can understand the alternative path also okay now if uh the trustor had accepted uh, the advisor says what would have happened now in a sense life is so complex that what alternative path could have taken place we don't know the important thing is that it could have been that dhutrasha took a very strong stand and then durudana openly rebelled against him and there might have been a dissension between the two of them and then maybe durudana might have what we don't know like aurangzeb arrested shahaja durudana mm-hmm. arrested this dhutrasha and still the war might have gone on or dhutrasha might have uh, arrested durudana and the war might have been stopped and durudana might have been punished by legal means for his wrong doing then the whole at no ghastly war would have been avoided so the kauravas had done serious mistakes and they would have had to get the consequences of that but specifically how it would have played out there are in the material world there are unlimited prob- possibilities so we don't have to uh, the, the, when it is said afterward that the war was destined that simply means that that uh, certain people who were miscreants they had to get certain reactions now how those reactions are supposed to come that varies from person to person now say if if a has done something wrong and b takes the law in his hands and kills a well that is wrong even if a deserves capital punishment still b cannot do it on their own it is the government who has to do it when b does it then b also becomes culpable so similarly uh, what we are uh, saying over here is that the, the if a has done something wrong and a has to die it can be because of the government doing it it can be because of b doing it now when b takes it in his own hand then b also becomes a part of the ongoing karmic cycle which gets extended if the government takes it up then the karmic cycle doesn't get extended that way so therefore uh, if certain people have done certain wrongs uh, they have to get the reactions for that but we have to decide whether we need to become the instruments for giving them those reactions or if some person is doing something wrong we may not be able to stop them from doing that wrong also but we may have to take a stand so vidura tried to take a stand when vidura couldn't take a stand he just was circumstantially allowed to leave from there so it's important for us that we, we strategically choose what is the best course of action in that situation okay miss mataji from yesterday's class i had this question as a practicing sadhana sadhaka what is our duty whether we should focus more on intent where we are trying to do something just to please krishna mm-hmm. or on the content too where some tangible results are also shown oh, and if okay. some tangible results are not shown then what should be our mood that yes at least i am working and pleasing krishna okay so in bhakti should we focus on the intent that i want to please krishna or the content that i do what will i know will please krishna even if i don't have the intent and if results don't come then what do we do how do we see that yeah prabhupad translated bhakti as devotional service so the idea is that we want to have a devotional mood internally and we want to be doing service externally but if you consider 12.8 to 11 in the bhagavad gita where first krishna talks about, just live with your mind and intelligence in me then he says fix your mind on me if you can't do that then follow the rules of sadhana bhakti if you can't do that also then at least work for me if you can't work for me then you give charity for some so basically krishna is giving various levels in that is krishna is telling it's not this or this if you can't do this do this and all of these are pathways to spiritual elevation so if we could have internally a devotional mood and externally do service that is that is very good but if we can't do that at the very least we try to do the keep doing the service externally and gradually by doing that service externally the internal mood will come uh, sometimes our devotee may think hey, if I, i can do this very well but if i do this very well i'll become proud i don't want to become proud so i won't do this service <laughs> but then actually to think that i will become proud is itself a sign of pride why because i am assuming i am not proud right now <laughs> <laughs> so it is not that uh, it is not that we don't have pride right now just like uh, uh, it's just like a lust sometimes some stimulus comes up then the lust comes up but that doesn't mean that lust is not there in the heart it is always there it comes up because of a stimulus similarly we all have the anartha of pride in our hearts 
but we just don't have any reason to express that pride say so i haven't i haven't done anything glorious so what will i be proud of right now so if it's not that after i do something special i become proud it's just that after i do something special i get a reason to express my pride so by not doing something special the pride is not going to go away the pride is still there in my heart and then if somebody else does something special that same pride will come up as envy you know some hey if i am a preacher and i said i will not preach and somebody else gives a very nice class and some other devotee say you know he speaks so nicely have you seen how much he eats <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we will start minimizing that person. <laughs> so what will happen? That pride is there in the heart, and it will come off as envy. So the 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 cure the cure for pride is not just not doing the service. It is actually doing the service, and by doing the service, gradually will become purified. Now. if that service makes us so proud that that pride becomes obnoxious then some devotees may tell us oh, let me don't do the service you do some other service but generally uh, if we are cultured then even if you are proud we won't be obnoxious with the pride and gradually we'll start seeing that this pride doesn't really give me that much happiness you know how much people will praise me i'll bask in that but if i'm remembering krishna that gives much more happiness so then gradually after that our focus will shift from the from the praise that we get for the service to the connection with krishna that the service gives us and then gradually how our intent will become pure. that yes if i do book distribution and then i get a big score and then people praise me for that i'm happy about that but even if i even if even if i don't distribute a lot of books even if others don't praise me still the activity of book distribution itself i have opportunity to serve krishna i have to speak about krishna with others that itself gives me joy so then the intent will become purified so the so for us we should continue the service always no matter what happens and the devotional intent will gradually come through through uh, the study practice of bhakti so so purification of intent is often a result of the execution of content it is when i execute the content when i do the activity again and again then the purification of intent will come so if i say that you know people say you know why do you chant so many times you know actually bhav you should chant with bhav with emotion you should chant even if you chant once the name of krishna with bhav that is enough what is the use of chanting 16 rounds every day just chant once with bhav <laughs> that's true but the problem is bhav ka abhav hai <laughs> you know <laughs> right now that bhav is not there and it is not just going to come automatically it will come by repeated chanting trying to be attentive as much as possible trying to have as much emotion as possible then gradually by that the devotion will come up so now if the external result doesn't come when we're doing some service then there are uh, different possibilities one is that it may just require some time we have to keep doing the service and we can see that this is what is uh, even if i don't uh, get the external result still the fact that i'm serving krishna is going to purify me and we are satisfied with that but because we want results in the outer world also so we have to see whether uh, may the may the service some adjustment needs to be done if i am going for book distribution and nobody is taking books then i have to see maybe i should go to some different area mm. or maybe in book distribution may not be my thing maybe i should do some other service mm. so we we don't have to make the uh, absence of results as a indication uh, that my service is a failure but at the same time the lack of results that can make us go through some introspection am i is there some way i can do the service better as i told you yesterday that prabhupad he was preaching in india and in india he changed things so much first he tried to do book, change the form of the service he tried back to god head then he tried league of devotees then he tried writing books he tried working with his god brothers even in america he was staying in butler then he came to new york then he went to lower east side so he tried different things till something worked so we are fixed in purpose but flexible in practice my purpose is to serve krishna but exactly how i will serve krishna we have to be flexible we see what works and then whatever works that is how we move forwards 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Same question, but a different context. If somebody else is doing the service and we see that the intention is there and the result is not coming out, hmm. then what should be the reaction or the behavior of a person, especially if somebody is maybe a Sikhya guru and seeing you know the people he's trying to train in the Krishna consciousness are not doing. Let's say somebody is not chanting properly, right? And the person says, "Oh, he'll come. I'm telling, but I should not point him right now because it will be a Vaishnava no aparad, or at least trying, but is not chanting rightly. So let me not correct it." Okay. So if somebody is making some, some content is wrong in what they are doing, say they're not chanting properly, then should somebody like a Siksha Guru point it out? The result of any interaction with a devotee, especially a devotee in a responsible position, should be that the subordinate should feel encouraged to practice bhakti. Sometimes we may have to correct people, but the correction should also be done in a context where Okay, you know, this is a mistake you made, but still, you know, uh, I respect you, I have affection for you, and you have, done, you have done many good things in the past, we respect you for that. So, if the result of the interaction is that, that person becomes so disheartened that they give up bhakti, then even if they are doing it improperly, let them do it, now there will be a time when we can correct it. See, the key thing is, uh, we have to understand the consciousness of the person. Some, there, are, there are two different contexts. There was one devotee who wrote to Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, I am the most fallen person. Prabhupada said, you are the most nothing. Hmm? Just do something practical. <laughs> another time, one devotee wrote to Prabhupada, he got a nice report of how he was doing preaching in another place and then he said, Prabhupada, I am such a fallen soul, but somehow by your mercy I am trying to serve Krishna. And Prabhupada wrote back, I need many, many fallen souls like you to assist me in sharing Krishna consciousness all over the world. <laughs> so the point is that sometimes some devotees may be just too inflated and then they have to be brought down to the earth. Hmm? So somebody is too proud, too, uh, too self-righteous, too self-congratulatory also. Then we have to point out, you know, this, is, this, this needs to be improved, this needs to be improved, this needs to be improved. So if somebody, if somebody is over enthusiastic, they have to be brought to the ground. Somebody is in the sky, bring them to the ground. But somebody is already half buried under the earth. <laughs> and they are already so discouraged. And then we criticize them. You know, you have not done this right. That criticism being like burying them fully under the ground. <laughs> they give up the practice of bhakti only. <laughs> so we have to see what the frame of that person is. And whether that person needs to be encouraged at that time or whether they need to be not discouraged but they need to be corrected so that they can be brought down to a more realistic level so there's no uh, fixed formula the purpose is that the person should be enthused to practice bhakti and that may require different uh, different modes of interaction at different times okay. thank you very much yes, Krishna. Sorry. yes sir. um sorry was there a question there yeah i think so. yeah go ahead go ahead please you Okay. So probably you've mentioned that uh, you know our mistakes are within Krishna's overall plan. But mm. those mistakes sometimes they cause a damage. Mm. So now what is the scope to repair that damage? Is there any way to you know, how do we how should be our disposition towards any damage correction or damage control? Yeah. Mm. So if some if some mistake has happened, then those mistakes have caused some consequence. So should that damage be controlled or corrected or should, uh, what should be done about that? Yes, you know, as devotees, uh, at a spiritual level, Krishna has forgiven us if we surrender to him. But at a material level, we do need to, if possible, make reparations if we have caused some harm to others. So, for example, we have Jagai Madai. They were forgiven by Lord Chaitanya. But then, after that, they went and begged forgiveness from all the people whom they knew that they offended. In fact, they had offended so many people, they had hurt so many people that they didn't even know. So they would just uh, actually stand by the banks of Jamuna and seek forgiveness from everyone. And then there's a Madhai Ghat, where they build a Ghat so that they could facilitate others. That was a way of uh, seeking forgiveness and making doing some reparation. Yes, we hurt you, but we have done something uh, to compensate for that. Now, what practically can be done, that we will have to see according to situation. So sometimes, uh, some making some reparations for some wrong, we don't want to bring back past wounds again 
and cause uh, like opening of the past wounds so we have to be careful that we do it in a sensitive way and sometimes the person is is still hurting then definitely apologizing and seeking forgiveness that helps a lot uh, but if that is a old wound which is over then there is no need to go and remind them of that so how exactly that is to be done that will have to be seen according to time place circumstance but certainly doing some kind of preparation for past wrongs is important answer your question thank you okay so those of you who want to carry on you can carry on we can continue questions for a few minutes after that I'll, I'll yes bro hari krishna hari bol thank you hari krishna so maybe uh, yeah thank you yes bro hari krishna it's one or two questions yeah yes bro so <coughs> So you mentioned the fact that you know, let's say, uh, just an example that oh, keeps an event is coming and we are like being thinking about the event for quite some time, and just the day before our throat goes bad or something. Like that. So uh, my question is more re- uh, regarding the mood of us at that time. Like, can we actually pray to Krishna that oh, please cure my throat pain so that I can sing? Okay. And, and uh, also, like, just to add on to that, like personally, my experience, like. even this could be applicable to day to day like yeah from a, like you know, stomach pain or headache i cannot get up in the morning but i really want to mm. get up chant go down can we pray to krishna to take away that and, okay uh, in yeah. my personal experience i feel like when i pray oh krishna please take it away i feel more connected to krishna rather than that's true so what yeah so can we pray to krishna say if, uh, if our throat is spoiled and the kirtan festival is there that my throat be healed or any material situation that is there Which is obstructing us in some way. Can we pray for the removal of that? See, certainly, praying uh, is a way we come closer to Krishna. And if praying basically is a way we share our heart with Krishna. And if something is burdening our heart, something is taking a big place in our heart, then sharing that with Krishna is the way we give him a place in our hearts. We want to become pure devotees. We cannot become pure devotees. without becoming devotees so i want to purely connect with krishna but before that i have to connect with krishna so sometimes the emphasis on pure devotion may be so much oh this is material this is material this is material i should not pray to krishna for this but then we are living in the material world so most of our concerns are related with material things only and the material things affect our spiritual life also so praying to krishna for something material is not wrong i would say that in bhakti and in karma kanda or in material religiosity and spiritual religion prayer itself has two different conceptions if you see in karma kanda prayer is primarily seen as a tool to get god to do something for us but if you see in bhakti uh, vandanam prayer is seen as a limb of devotional service so now if i like shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam pada sevanam archanam vandanam So now, if I am hearing about Krishna, or if I am chanting Krishna's names, if I am doing deity worship, now is there some specific result I expect from that? No. Krishna, the Bhagavatam says that create a Bhagavatya Dhatan Manne Dita Muttama. That these increase our attraction to Krishna. So we do here chanting and all these activities for connecting with Krishna, for developing our relationship with Krishna, for becoming more attracted to Him. So similarly, Vandanam. also we can see as an activity for connecting with krishna so praying may have a particular request but uh, we don't make that request the center point of the prayer we don't uh, define the success of the prayer based on whether that request is fulfilled or not because sometimes some devotees say that if i pray to krishna and that thing doesn't happen then i my faith in prayer will go down my faith in uh, krishna may also go down so better i'll not pray to krishna only. No, that's a distorted understanding. Praying is connecting with Krishna. So Prabhupada says in a, I think a fourth, third canto of purport, Karma Muni section that a devotee desires to see the Lord, but a devotee doesn't demand to see the Lord. So desiring to have darshan of the Lord that is bhakti, but not demanding is also bhakti. That's sur- that's sur- subordination, surrender. So sa- the same principle can be applied to all aspects of our life. We desire, but we don't demand. we are individuals and individuals means we will have our individual desires so having a particular desire you know let my this health improve or 
लेट माई थ्रोट इम्प्रूव और लेट माई जॉब सिचुएशन इम्प्रूव लेट मी गेट अ बेटर जॉब ओवर हियर और वॉट एवर दीज थिंग्स कैन प्रे फॉर दैम बट वी डोंट मेक आर भक्ति कंडीशनल टू दैम ओनली आफ्टर दिस हैपन्स देन आई बी एबल टू प्रैक्टिस भक्ति येस आई बी एबल टू प्रैक्टिस भक्ति दे आर बेटर एट दैट टाइम बट इवन नाउ आई एल कंटिन्यू प्रैक्टिसिंग भक्ति एंड इफ दैट हैपन्स आई एल बी एबल टू डू इट बेटर सो दैट वे वी डोंट हैव टू डिनाई आवर ह्यूमन कंसर्नस अ प्लेस इन आवर रिलेशनशिप विथ कृष्णा बट वी डोंट रिड्यूस आवर रिलेशनशिप विथ कृष्णा टू ओनली एड्रेसिंग आवर फॉर ह्यूमन कंसर्नस ओके थैंक यू one more clarification on the point is yeah. like also the fear is there that that hopefully this does not become a habit mm-hmm. like we don't want to just keep asking krishna for everything like is that also a thought that we should consider okay so praying to krishna for material things should not become a habit well i would say it's not so much that should not become a habit it is that that habit should not predominate our relationship with krishna mm. because at a level material things you know if i am going for a program and i'm getting late then i should i pray to krishna krishna please <laughs> let me get, get <laughs> let me reach the program on time <laughs> now okay that's fine but you know if that is the only time i'm praying to krishna it's like you know the like sometimes your the child is staying uh so child is staying somewhere in a hostel and the only time the child calls is ask to ask for money You know, they don't ask how you are. What are you doing? I'm thinking, can I get, please send me some money? Please send me some money. Then that will create a bad taste in the relationship. So, uh, if there are some practical material concerns for which want, we want to pray to Krishna, that's okay. But the important thing is we have practices of bhakti going on, respective of, and, and they are the defining aspects of our relationship with Krishna. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll come. Yes, Mataji. Um, <coughs> Shankaran, if you ever want to add any comments, please feel free to add anything. Uh, um, you yeah. had you had given a kind of humorous example, but <coughs> like of envy, you know, like somebody said, wasn't that such a great lecture? He's such a good speaker. Yeah, but he eats too much. Well, I have this experience that there are many devotees who are wonderful speakers and great storytellers, especially about Prabhupada, and wonderful kirtan singers. But then, like my husband's like totally non-envious of anyone, or never finds fault with anyone. And then I think, yeah, but they're not following. You know, like okay. wonderful kirtan singers, and I know them personally, and they're not chanting their rounds. You know, they're they're not following the process yeah, okay. really. But mm. it's very pleasing. Their kirtans like stir your heart. what they're speaking stirs your heart but at the same time i feel like blocked like i'm not totally open to allowing okay. them to that's a good question yeah within my heart so yeah i understand what you're saying so if uh, somebody is sings very beautifully or speaks very eloquently but they're not following the process of bhakti properly so they're not chanting their rounds then we are not able to appreciate them so much so what you can we do at this situation see there are two distinct aspects over here one is that there is a standard process of bhakti which is recommended for enabling us to become purified in this life and to attain krishna but there are also some devotees even they may be senior they may have practiced for many years but somehow for whatever reason they feel that they can't practice this whole process Hmm? they just don't feel inspired they just can't do it whatever then if they are doing one form of service that is also good and if they are doing it well that is also to be appreciated mm-hmm. better than they give up bhakti completely if if somebody there are many people if you see traditionally in india uh, there are some people who would just love to come to the temples and do some puja over there or do some seva but they would not uh, do other forms of devotion service some people just whenever there is a katha they will come for the katha But if you tell them to do japa, they will not do japa. Hmm? They will come to do seva. Like some people, they are very eager. They will come to temple and serve prasadam, but they will not want to sit and hear the lecture. Hmm? Or they may do deity worship, but they will not choose chanting. Now, at one level, we can say that all forms of devotional service have their potency. And if anyone is doing any one form of devotional service, that is also going to connect with them and with Krishna. And if they do it beautifully, do they do it well in a way that inspires others? then what we see is 
that by their past karma they have been given this skill the skill to speak the skill to write the skill to sing and with the bhakti that they have they are using so the bhakti inside and the skill outside both of them by which this they are performing this devotional service well and in that sense they are connecting with krishna and they are connecting others also with krishna so we appreciate that uh, in that sense there is no need to look at what they are not doing and hold it against them at the same time th there has to be a differentiation between those devotees who are uh, dedicated fully to krishna in this we don't want such devotees to become the role models in our movement that they are doing service to krishna we appreciate that we value that and we uh, krishna accepts service from everyone so somebody is doing a particular service nicely why can't we, why can't krishna accept that we can also accept that but then uh, they shouldn't become the role models now they will become the role models for some people definitely but if those should be people who will anyway not going to practice the four process of bhakti somebody just loves kirtan and there are many say uh, devotee kids they are not interested in practicing the full process of bhakti but at least they are coming for kirtans and they love the kirtans so that is the krishna so it's like say a father has two sons and one of them is brilliant is got 80% usually gets 80% marks in the exam other just scrapes through gets 40% now if that 40% person has got 60% marks the father will say bravo well done and the 80% also comes and say i also got 60% what have you done <laughs> so now for the 40% person 60% is a step up but for the 80% student for 60% is down so so what should not happen is that when we praise somebody who is at 60% we appreciate them but that doesn't mean 60% is the ideal for those at 40% 60% is the ideal but for somebody who is 80% they should not think 60% is the ideal so there has to be a, a proper education given where we don't minimize devotees who are not practicing the process but at the same time we explain things in a holistic way by which those who are practicing bhakti in a dedicated way uh, following the full process of bhakti they become the role models they are considered as the exemplary leaders it is said that bhagwan bhakti sanat thakur was departing at that time there was one devotee who was a very good sweet singer he was singing kirtans and bhakti sanat thakur he requested that some other devotee sing and that devotee was not a very sweet singer but he was known as a very faithful devotee so bhakti sanat thakur wanted to hear his kirtans at that time so that that aspect is also there so we don't reject their service but we also uh, in a in a non critical way make it clear who the role models who the leaders of the movement should be and who people should aspire to become like and if they can't become like this then then there are other options also you can just practice bhakti at this level that's also fine so we can say that there are multiple uh multiple levels of devotion so rather than seeing this is a devotee and this is a non devotee you can say that there are many concentric circles of expanding radii and all the people are connected with krishna at different levels now there can be outer radius also where somebody is situated and they are also connected with krishna somebody that inner radius at we could say that all these concentric circles form a pyramid and somebody is near the top of the pyramid somebody is somewhere near the bottom of the pyramid they are all on the path to krishna different levels so what shouldn't happen is that somebody at the bottom big that becomes the standard and everybody thinks if i become like this that's good enough no we always should try to improve but if you can't then we're happy to hear also does that answer your question in a way yeah yeah very much but you know like you said they should know what the standard is the example but how are they going to know you going to tell them but just like you said like mm -hmm. someone's like that's so inspiring like my husband he's inspired by everybody and uh, and um so what am i going to say yeah but do you know really okay that, no no like, like, you know so no okay <laughs> <laughs> but, no I, what it means is that what when i say that they should well, not like become they Now that they should not become the role model means that what should see generally if somebody is not doing a particular form of bhakti they are not going to go and broadcast and tell the world right. you know i give such katha but i don't chant the rounds hmm? right. so you also don't chant the rounds nobody is going to do that publicly right. so if somebody is going to say the three different situations somebody has come and does nice kirtans and they come and they go 
and devotees when they they also come and do kirtans with them and they feel inspired and they they go on with their bhakti that's perfectly fine but somebody start thinking you know i want to i want to make them into my shiksha guru or diksha guru or something like that i want to take regular guidance from them then uh, then we may have to tell them in a confidential forum that you know, this is this is what they are doing this is what they are not doing right now so if you want to take guidance keep this in mind we don't have to tell it publicly to everyone because most people you know so many devotees come in the horizon of our consciousness mm. and they inspire us in different ways and then they go out if somebody is seeking a steady relationship with them then we may have to tell them that you know this is this is this is issues and the real serious situation would be if somebody start justifying their their half half hearted practice based on them see that devotee is also not chanting my rounds i wish i also chant not to chant my rounds i'll just come for kirtans and if somebody who was chanting gives up chanting and tries to become like that then it is a serious problem otherwise if some inspiration is there every devotee has their own deficiencies Now, some deficiencies are more glaring some deficiencies are less glaring and we don't have to necessarily talk about the deficiencies of someone if somebody is inspired that it's good if they take the inspiration and move in their path towards krishna but if they want to seek a steadier relationship with them then better to in a private way privately respectful way we clap Yes, please. So I remember we used to go and many years ago in Chopadi we had a devotee Shivan Prabhu. He used to I mean. Ah, mm, yeah, yeah, okay. He used to drink wine and come to temple. <laughs> and if you are sitting with him, he will be thinking. But he was such a good musician, such a good musician. He would teach harmonium and also singing so many brahmacharis. Mm. And even his brother Sarnath Maharaj would learn from him. So he would sit with Maharaj and he would come drink. Only in the Maharaj is sitting with him. So his wife was initially the devotee of course. She was initiated by Radha Maharaj. So one time she was sitting with uh, her husband Maharaj. He said, Maharaj, see, you know, he drinks and he doesn't chant on Jap Mala. So Maharaj said, you know, you are chanting on beads, and he is chanting on reeds. So absolutely, there's no difference. <laughs> <laughs> and he got so inspired by just that statement. Wow. He went and told practically whole Brahmachari. You know what Maharaj said? He's chanting on beads, and I'm chanting on reeds. There's no difference. Reeds, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reeds, reeds are actually in harmonium. You know, oh. we use the reeds. Oh, I see. I thought because we have reeds here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. so it's as in many of the past life memory cases which we used to talk about reincarnation uh, to demonstrate reincarnation illustrate it uh, there are people who were meat eaters but they seem to again come back in a human body but lord chaitanya said that somebody who eats meat 
they will have to take many many births in animal species so how do we understand this uh, there are there are certain statements which are made in scripture which are true but they need not be true in a absolute sense they are meant to demonstrate the gravity of a particular action say for example it may be said that if somebody kills an animal then they will become that animal that animal will become a human being and that animal human being will kill them now this is is it that it is going to happen for every single incident like that there is it is also said gahana if karma is very difficult to understand now this is so simple you know i kill animal the animal kills me what is the difficulty in this so this is a this is a possibility but this is not a necessity no it may be that that the principle here is that if we have done some karmic bad karma we will get a reaction to that and that reaction will also be serious but specifically what reaction will get what form the reaction will come in that will vary it is not that every single person who kills an animal will have to necessarily become an animal and be killed by an, by that soul now if that soul the soul who is in animal's body that comes to human body and that person becomes a devotee now still is it that they have to kill an animal they given me a meat eating so why will they kill an animal then so the point is that this these are the possibilities that can happen and the possibility is given as a example to demonstrate the principle that actions have reactions specific forms may vary how a particular reaction comes i am having said that uh, there is also the other principle that madhyashtanti rajasaha that krishna says in the bhagavad gita those who live in the mode of passion uh, they stay they stay in this world those who live in ignorance they go down to lower species those who live in goodness go up those who are in passion they stay at this level of reality that means we can say they come back as human beings madhyati shtanti rajasaha so most people do live in the mode of passion and that's how they can come back as human beings another point is that our next life is not determined simply by our actions in this lifetime the karma from our past lives also comes into the picture so somebody by their past lives karma may be meant to get this human birth and another human birth also so now the karma which they have done in this life it will have its reactions it may come in the human life itself in some terrible form of distresses that they may get so the principle is that action will produce reaction apart from that the details are immensely varied so we don't uh, we don't necessarily have to say that uh, now when it says it eat one who eats meat chaitanya mahaprabhu is there talking about the the not just animal he specifically talking about a cow somebody who kills a cow there are some very grievous reactions for that but meat eating has always been a part of human society and meat eating has been part of vedic culture also the kings would hunt and they would not just hunt for exhibition some of them would hunt for exhibition in the first canto of shrimad bhagavatam prabhupad says that he talks about the king rantidev so although he is a kshatriya he never ate meat now what does it mean kshatriyas would normally eat meat now it's what does that mean that simply means that see that if kshatriyas have to go for war i mean they are going for war if they have to go to the distant forested lands at that time you cannot carry grains you all the time and grains just would go in the forest so if somebody has to do a lot of physical hard work fighting is exhausting work at that time simply by fruits sages who are doing austere life they can eat fruits and roots and they can live but soldiers who are going on an expedition where they need physical strength uh they can't carry grains all the time with them and even if grains are there you know grains have to be cultivated grains be cooked so how would they do they would if they are in the forest they would shoot animals and eat them so in the bhagavatam 11th canto also there is a verse that uh intoxication sex and illicit sex and uh and meat eating these are the normal ways of people's living but the spiritual spiritually avoid them pravrutte bhutanam nivrutis tu mahafalam that bhutanam for most living being this is the common way of living pravrutresha bhutanam but if one can do in nivrutta then mahafalam a great fruit is awaiting us so what shila if you look at overall what shila prabhupad was saying he was he was against meat eating but especially he was against the organized slaughter houses where people where animals are cultiv- uh, cultivated like crops to be killed this the sheer scale of meat eating 
uh, and the sheer scale of cruelty against animals that ended meat has always been a part of most human beings diet but if you see nature has also endowed us we have uh, only a few canine teeth which can eat a little bit of meat but we have never had the resources by which we could in an organized way slaughter thousands and millions of animals so that organ so meat was a if it, for the people who would eat meat it was a one part of their diet but now for most people meat is almost a part of every meal and that is considered the major source of nourishment so and the way it is done also very very brutal so we have to uh, we have to be uh, to understand the context in which what shri prabhupad said certain things so in the vedic culture there were uh, even and yudhishthir is going up to the mountains badrikashram you know there there are many brahmins coming with him and that one time he says that you know, he says oh venerable ones now we are going up and food will be very scarce over there so those of you who cannot live without meat please you can go somewhere else we will, i will not be able to provide you that in this forested area there's nothing about that means even brahmins used to eat meat we say how can brahmanas eat meat actually it is that the there is sattva guna rajoguna tamoguna the three modes and there are forms of worship also accordingly so there in the forms of tamas when the goddess is to be worshiped then meat is a part of the worship of the goddess now who is going to do that worship there are brahmanas for that purpose also so now those brahmanas are also respected as brahmanas but they are not the brahmanas who are followed by those who are vaishnavas or those who are do you worship in sattva guna rajoguna so we don't have to become excessively judgmental about people who are eating meat we have to look at the context and we definitely want to avoid me avoid uh, we would like that slaughter house is closed on especially uh, prabhupada would say that if at, even, even if you can't give up eating meat at least wait for the animal to die naturally then you can take their meat don't kill the animal don't kill the cows so uh, the principle is cruelty against animals has to be avoided and meat can be minimized as much as possible but uh, we don't have to become ju- very uh, judgmental and we don't have, and we can't make any definitive statement just because when say somebody has eaten meat they are going to go to animal species well what does it mean just if once in a lifetime they eat meat that's going to happen or throughout the lifetime or is it that once in a lifetime and throughout the lifetime both have similar consequences no there is so much uh, so much uh, variability in how karma comes out and we focus on just trying to use whatever knowledge we have to serve krishna so if some people are remembering their past lives and from empirical perspective uh, it seems to be a reasonable case that all these things they are remembering uh, it's it's there is no logical way which they could have known unless they were that person then in a provisional sense we can accept that this person is reincarnated this person this is not shastra vak you know don't say this is absolute truth but this is something which can be used for people to to uh get a get some faith in the principles of the bhagavad gita it's like in medicine if you want to demonstrate okay somebody uh, a particular disease one time i was admitted in the hospital i have, since my birth i have a hole in my heart hmm so it's a small hole but it's a related and so once i was admitted in a government hospital and then because i had this vsd so it's like the whole medical school they are that is they studying the heart they all came to exam me so they were putting there it was like 120 students came you know they were all putting their stethoscope on my heart and they were exam <laughs> so they can you hear the hear the regular heart or the heart beat now so the point is that uh, if if a doctor wants to teach a particular uh, particular medical issue now if the doctor waits for a ideal case to come up and they are not going to get ideal case so the ideal case uh, so okay the patient may if some if you want to show how serious uh, a heart problems can be if the person has cholesterol also this person has this also this also then you may be able to see that in a very serious but in one case all the principles that a doctor wants to teach demonstrate may not come doctor may teach one principle to one case and another principle to another case so we can't expect if we want to give some empirical evidence for spiritual principles we can't expect one case 
to demonstrate all those principles. So we use one case for one purpose. Some, now that way we can say that uh, you know so anybody, it is said anybody who takes prashad also they will always get a human body. Hmm? That's what Prabhupada also said. Anybody who touches my body will get a human body. Anybody who practices a little bhakti also they will never lose their human form. And Jad Bhar, Bharat Maharaj had practiced so much bhakti that he had gone to a he almost near the stage of prema. His bhav he cried tears of love, and yet he became a deer. So how did that happen? Now, in this particular pastime, what is demonstrated is the principle that oh, if you remember whatever you remember at the time of that, that's what you will attain. What about the principle that you will never lose the human form of life? No, that principle doesn't apply over here. It's not that in one case all principles will apply. That, that principles essential essentials apply. That once if you have practiced bhakti once, you will not lose the opportunity to practice bhakti. The human form is normally the opportunity or the facility to practice bhakti. So in in but in that deer in Bharat Maharaj's case, when he became a deer, as a consequence of the action, in my sort of material and spiritual two parallel streams. So at a material level, the action had the reaction that he lost the human form and he got a deer's body. But at a spiritual level, in a deer's body also he had so he had actually the consciousness of advanced, spiritually advanced human being. That still he was going to the sages and he was hearing spiritual sound vibrations from them. So uh, sometimes in, in working in real life, one principle may take precedence and other principle is not rejected. But other principles application may be appropriately modified. So, so we can't have a test case uh, where all the principles will be demonstrated. So we say that the principle of karma is also there and the principle of karma will also apply. Those who are eating meat, they will also get the reactions for that. But we can't expect that in one case both the reactions of karma also come and also that your person remember the past life also. It's like no medical study will ever have an ideal case and don't wait to teach till they get the ideal case. They use whatever cases they have and they teach them as a similarly with us also. Okay. May I ask an auxiliary question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Please. Yeah. You know, I've heard a lot of uh, conversations, Prabhupada's conversations books, and in many of the conversations, Prabhupada always um, really approves that whatever religion someone is following, if they're following it according to their religion, then they're good, then they're proper. So at the same time, if somebody's eating meat and they think in their religion it's approved, are they sinning? That's my question. Hmm. OK. So if somebody Mm, is eating meat and they think it is approved in their religion. So is it sin or is it not sin? Uh, we can have in one of the principles in the Vedic in the Bhagavatam in general is that morality is not just category. It is contextual. That means morally this is right, this is wrong. These are not simply rigid categories. They are categories. So, but there are contexts also. Say, speaking lies is wrong. But then, if say some uh, mad mob is chasing a friend of ours, and that person comes to our house, please save me. And that person, we, we get them to hide in our basement or somewhere. And the mob knocks on our door. Is he here? Should I speak the truth? If I speak the truth, he will be killed. So, in this case, speaking truth will be causing harm. So, I should not speak the truth at that time. So, what is right and what is wrong, it's not just category, it's also contextual. So, why I'm giving this point is that sin, is what is sinful and what is not sinful, is also uh, not just category, it is also contextual. So, for example, it is said that in the Tamas, even in Vedic path also, in the those who worship the goddess, they eat meat, they offer a goat and then they eat meat. And that's considered part of their worship. Now, are they sinning? If you use sin in the absolute sense, yes, that killing will have its consequence. Mm -hmm. But in the religion, they are any tweet meat. So, at the very least, what is happening that they are the worship of the goddess. For the uh, while uh, while eating meat as a part of the worship of the goddess, they are regulating the eating of the meat accordingly. So then from the level where they are, they are elevated. 
so they would have eaten meat wantonly and no done no piety now at least they are doing some piety and eating meat in a regulated way so in that sense you could say that from where they are they are now whether they are going to go all the way to transcendence well unlikely so similarly if in some somebody's religion meat eating is allowed or that's what they think and they are eating meat well if overall they are living piously uh, at least more piously than otherwise they have been then that is good for them they can eat it now just like in our tradition also if somebody is practicing tamasic religion at least they are rising from tamasic to rajoguna from the mode of ignorance to the mode of passion now if they can practice and rise to a transcendence that's much better but if they can't then at least they are rising from where they are and that is also appreciated so na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma yakinam joshet sarva karmani vidwan yukta samachara that don't disturb the minds of ignorant people just engage them so that they can be elevated from where they are that's 3.26 in the gita so we don't have to become judgmental with people about uh hey, you are eating meat so therefore you are bad no if they are practicing according to their faith that's good and there are many uh many christians for example who practice vegetarianism and advocate vegetarianism if you see even in the indian tradition uh it is uh, that uh, when buddhism started spreading buddhism actually uh, started creating the ethos of vegetarianism because buddha said no you should not eat meat and then even in the hindu sacrifices where sometimes there was animal yagya pashu yagya dan so as a response to that madhvacharya ramacharya they said actually there's no need to do pashu yagya what you can do is you can create a green replica of animal And just put that in ahuti so the vedas do have sections because the vedas are for all levels of people they are kalpataru there are sections in the tamo people in tamaguna also so there it is said that you do animal sacrifice in the ramayana in the mahabharata in the bhagavatam sometimes animal sacrifice is talked about and live animals are killed but and there is no no evidence that each time an animal is killed the soul immediately gets a human form that is ideally meant to happen but is it that all of them were doing it that way we don't know but it was that is a part of the sacrifice but then eventually when the overall society started becoming vegetarian uh, because of the influence of buddhism then when people started coming back to the vedic fold also the acharya said that shankaracharya madhacharya ramacharya many places they said that actually the principle is that you have to offer something to the fire so when people are meat eaters and they consider meat to be very valuable then in the yagya you offer a an animal but if you can offer grains or you can offer a, a animal image made of something else that will also do and they would they code appropriate verses for that so we could say scripture is omniform omniform means within scripture there are many forms of practices given for people at different levels so it is the acharyas who select the right forms which are best for elevating people at that particular level so as vegetarianism is becoming more widespread in today's world so we are also seeing that there are many christians who write books about vegetarianism in Christ- in christianity i have seen a couple of couple of books which talk about vegetarianism in islam also so that ethos will also spread so basically we don't have to when people are practicing a particular religion coming from a particular context then we don't have to necessarily always judge them from a absolute standard of morality mm. we can say that yes meat meat eating is not good for one spiritual elevation but in their particular situation that if that religious process is elevating them upwards then we appreciate that let's answer your question okay so last question i'll stop yeah <laughs> Yeah. So if somebody is not doing chanting japa, somebody is not following vegetarianism, but they are doing shravanam, kirtanam. What is their what is their destination? See, you know, f- this question, what is someone's destination? It presumes uh, omniscience. 
<laughs> you know, for all practical purposes, you know, we can't know even our own destination. You know, we, uh, Prabhupada has assured us, and in that sense, we can say that after practicing bhakti, nicely we'll go to Krishna. But then there is also, you know, we also have to become purified. So we understand that if anybody is connected with Krishna, they will get elevated, and Krishna will give them further practices to practice, further facilities to practice bhakti. So where, where they will go exactly? That will vary from person to person. So sometimes uh, we become a little too too judgmental. You know, hey, that, you know if you're doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing this. Then therefore you're not practicing bhakti properly. Well, there is no guarantee that everybody who is a scorn devotee they're going to go back to Godhead also. So yes, we may say, okay, chant 16 rounds, four regular principles. What does that mean? 16 rounds. If I chant 16 rounds while watching TV. And I do that, and if I do that throughout my life, every day, two hours I watch TV, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna. I counted 16 rounds. So will I go back to God? <laughs> so, you know, these are movements which are ins given to inspire us to practice bhakti wholeheartedly. But whether everything in a literal sense is going to turn out the same way, we, we don't really know that and we know that if we are, we are following pro, we are following Krishna's pure devotee we are in Krishna's circle and Krishna will take care of us but the exact care of that we vary from person to person so uh, similarly those who are practicing bhakti in this way they are connected with Krishna and they will Krishna will take them to a place where they will stay connected with him in fact they will be able to better connect with him also but uh, say yuga, we say chanting is the yuga dharma but there are many Vaishnu sampradayas also who don't emphasize so much chanting but if you look at their lives some of those uh, some of those devotees some of those followers of the Vaishnava they are very saint hmm? so is it that because they are not chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra or they are not chanting Japa a particular number of rounds they are not going to get elevated no we don't have to we don't have to become too judgmental about this see we see that each is a sampradaya is like a university hmm? and each university will have to some extent its own mode of examination, its own syllabus, its own way of assessments. The purpose is the same, that you want to give a degree. But each university will have some value. So, some, so in our Sampradaya, uh, our Acharya has told us to chant a particular number of rounds and that is our primary sadhana. In some other Sampradaya, they may tell some other sadhana, they may tell you to deity worship every day. And then mantra japa, you do whenever you can or whatever. So then if they are following that, they will also be elevated. Now, how much who will be elevated is dependent not just on the external practices. It is dependent on the internal connection with Krishna. And of course, the external practices help connecting with Krishna better. So, naturally doing more, doing more external practices sincerely is always advantageous. But we have to just focus on uh, recognizing that, that we are be faithful to what we are practicing. At the same time, we be respectful to what others are practicing. And don't become judgmental about who is going to go where. Did I answer your question? So thank you very much. The Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki.